Hey folks, Andy Allen here for Applied Shirt Again. We're just going to head out to the karate cabin here. And today I want to talk to you about Kion. See, I think Kion, traditional Kion, is broken. Uh, Kion, I believe, should be a tool, not a goal. And today, a lot of people seem to treat Kion as a uh, something to do to get ready for their test, for their for their fifth Q test or their showdown test. And the, the, the form over function approach is killing karate. So this video is to promote a blog I recently wrote on Kion. The title is Kion is a tool, not a goal. And I think that's really, really important words to remember. So a second ago, I mentioned Kion is broken uh, because there's too much of a form over function approach. Basically, uh, that emphasis on form over function stems from the post-World War II era of karate, where the, really the focus was, was developing um, strong bodies and, and uh, the mental fortitude to kind of push through hardship when you're training, and it wasn't necessarily geared towards functionality. All right, so I'm going to share with you a number of different issues that I have with traditional Kion, what I consider to be flaws, and how we can fix those in our daily training. Now, before we go any further, though, I think it's important that I share with you uh, my goal. So my goal for karate is to develop functional skill. And for me, a good rule of thumb for our Kion practice is that it should develop transferable skills. It should develop skills that we can directly use for either fighting or for self-defense. If we can't use those skills for either, then in my opinion, it's not functional. Now, your opinion might differ because maybe your goals are different. Um, maybe for you, Kion is for the development of body movement, for speed and power, that's okay. If that's your goals and you're going to disagree with me, um, that's okay. We have different purposes, different uh, reasons for training. All right, the first flaw in traditional Kion is, you guessed it, Hikate. Now, at the risk of uh, launching another Hikate debate, uh, th there's so much wrong with it. So Hikate means pulling hand it means you are pulling something to your body. I can be pulling a limb, I can grab someone's uh, collar, I can grab their hair, pull them in, I can punch them, grab them, whatever. Hikate, pulling hand, is pulling something. Pulling your hand to your hip does not generate more power in your punch. Uh, people, all the time, they, they uh, misquote scientific principles, they mis misapply them rather. Uh, it's just, the science doesn't support it. Um, that's probably a, a topic for another post. Um, but let, let's say this, for the sake of argument, let's say that Hikate actually makes your punch stronger. Tactically, it's a really silly thing to do because obviously if I punch like this, my, my face is wide open, okay? I'm going to get knocked out. Whereas if I punch here and keep, keep my hand, my head, my head covered, I'm much better protected, okay? So Hikate, it doesn't serve uh, any function developing power. It leaves your face wide open, so we should do it. So how do we fix it? It's very simple, just stop doing it. When I joined the World Combat Association, the first thing I did, uh, I, I wanted to include Kion in my syllabus, but I didn't want to do it the traditional way. So the first thing I did was abandon Hikate. So let's say we're doing a uh, Kizamizuki Yakuzuki combination. So the, the traditional way, I know you can't see my legs here from my stance, but it would be like, like this, okay? We pull our hand back, we pull our hand back. So instead, I had my students go one, two. So it's one, okay, with our dead hand is here by our, our head. It's a guard, and then two, right? It's much more functional, and we're developing good habits. We're not developing bad habits. Bad habit, pull your hand to your hip. I am walking proof of that. Uh, for, for years and years and years, I kept punching like this because I did so much in Kion and in my kata. And so when I'm, when I'm fighting in tournaments and whatnot, I pull my hand back, my face is wide open. You can probably get away with that in a point competition, uh, but in a real scenario where someone's trying to actually make impact your head and take your head off, it's just not a good idea. Hikate, let's just stop doing it. All right, number two flaw in traditional Kion is keep the heel down at all costs. Now, sometimes you want to have the heel down and sometimes you don't want to have the heel down. It depends what you're doing. If from a striking perspective, if we want to generate the, the maximum amount of, of uh, impulse into a target, uh, we need to move our mass into the target. If we keep our heel down, let's look at our, our Yakuzuki. 
right? So maybe uh, you're practicing your kion, you start from a guidon bry, and you, you do this with your hecate and everything, okay? And as soon as you see someone doing this, uh, the instructor's saying, heel down, heel down. Uh, and usually the reason he will give for keeping your heel down is for increased stability. Well, stability is sometimes desirable, but if our goal is to generate impact into the target, it's not stability that we're looking for. We're looking for movement of mass forward into the target. So if I keep my heel down, my, the amount of distance my mass moves is very, very minimal. If I rotate correctly around my left hip joint, right, and I do something like this. So my hips kind of move from here to here, a li li little bit of mo forward motion in that right hip. But it's very minimal. If I want to generate a lot of impact into my target, what I want to do is move my mass into the target. And this doesn't allow you to move your mass forward by keeping your heel down, right? So in a kind of a, a mid or long range kind of distance here, if I want to hit this hard, and I want to come into the target, I can hit it quite hard. Now there is one scenario, or a couple of scenarios, where you might want to keep your heel down. Uh, punching at close range, so if I'm here, Right? I don't need to move my mass forward. Maybe I've got a hold of someone here or I've got my hand up covered and it's boom. Right? So I, can, I don't need to move my mass a lot and I'm generating my, my force primarily with pushing out the floor and rotation of the body into the target. So heel down is fine there. Other situation where you want your heel down is grappling. Okay, so if I'm grappling with, with someone here, I, I need to be stable. As soon as I come up on my, my toes like this, I've lost my stability, my connection to the floor, and that's a problem. So basically, heel down at all cost. I say no, it depends on what you're doing. And I think our, our kion should be uh, flexible to allow for that. So let's look at a, um, a kizemizuki yakuzuki combination, or your, your jab cross. So typically you would do something like this, right? One, two, three, something like that if you're doing it from a static position on the floor. The way I have my student do it right from the very beginning is, is here. So we're, we're going to use some footwork, which I'll talk about later on, but we're moving our mass forward. It's one, two, one, two, one, two, and the heel is allowed to raise up. Flaw number three in traditional kion would be posture. Now, before I go any further, let me remind you of my goal for functional kion is to develop skills that are transferable to fighting or for self-defense, okay? said no boxing coach ever, keep your chin up. It just doesn't happen because keeping your chin up is, is just asking to get knocked out. Whether you're in uh, a Muay Thai or boxing or full contact karate fight, uh, you, you don't want to keep your, your chin up. So when we do hours and hours and hours and hours of kion and you are conditioning yourself, developing bad habits to keep your chin up, right? up like this with a straight spine, this is the correct posture for doing traditional kion. But we're training bad habits. We're training ourselves to put ourselves in a position where we are vulnerable. So what I suggest is to allow ourselves to tuck the chin a little bit, raise the shoulders a little bit while we are doing our kion. So again, if I look at that same white belt combination that I have in my curriculum, that Kizamizuki Yakuzuki, instead of, uh, with this erect posture, I want to see my students a little bit forward, okay? Shoulders can come up a little bit, right? Chin tucked a little bit, all right? From here, and we, we don't, by the way, I don't teach my kion from a, a down block, a guillem bry. It's all done from a free stance here. And that kizamazuki yakuzuki looks like one, two. So the chin is tucked down a little bit, one, two. The guard's held high, no hikate, one, two. The heel can come up, one, two, right? As opposed to this. Right? It's just not a good habit. Now, you might be saying, ah, but that's for beginners. When you're a black belt, you learn how to move uh, uh, and protect yourself. Well, I don't know. I've seen lots and lots of black belts that uh, they, they keep their chin up. Um, when I get students training with me, they have come from other clubs, uh, and we're doing pad work or doing some sparring or something, their, their chins are way up. It doesn't matter if they're a seventh Q or a second N. Um, the habits have been ingrained. They keep their chin up. They pull their, their, their hiccate back. They keep their heel on the floor. There's so many, so many bad habits that develop. 
All right, flaw number four, and this is in particular true of Shotokan Kion, long fixed stances. Now remember, my mantra is Kion is a tool, not a goal. It should be a tool that we use as a piece of our training to develop transferable skills for fighting and for self-defense, whatever your focus is. Now, I'm not saying that we should never train long stances. Long stances can have some function. You can use a long stance to, to kind of wedge behind someone's leg and break their balance for throws and takedowns. They are of use. Um, but I don't think the training in long stances all the time, in particular long fixed stances, and by fixed I mean not moving, okay? I think that's uh, problematic. Do boxers, do Muay Thai fighters, uh, martial artists that don't have forms, patterns, a like kata, do they practice fixed positions and really pay a lot of attention? No, they don't. Uh, they're, they're focused on boom, boom, and, they're, and they're, they're kind of pivoting offline and so on, but they're not looking at the static position with a, a stiff back leg and a front stance and, and their toe at particular angles. They are 100% looking at efficiency of movement for the purpose of gaining angles and smashing their opponent. They're not worried about looking good necessarily. Stances aren't something that we're supposed to uh, obsess over. Uh, but that is very much the case in a lot of uh, uh, karate seminars I've been to over the year, the, the 3K variety. Uh, for example, let's say you're doing Zen Kutsudashi, uh, the instructor comes along and wa wants you to move your knee from here to here, or your, your back foot from here to here. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, now, some things do matter. Let's say you're practicing Kukutsudashi, your back stance, and your, your feet are supposed to be angled at a 90 degree angle like that. So if you have your back foot out like this, but your knee is in here, that's a problem because you're putting some stress on your knee and over time that is going to lead to injury. So that sort of thing does need to be corrected. Uh, now, if you have poor ankle flexibility and you just can't have your, ankle, your, your, your back foot at 90 degrees from your front foot, then that's not something we should obsess over. So allow it to move over so long as that knee doesn't collapse in then it's all good. Or maybe the person should kind of uh, have a higher stance than what is optimal. Uh, I don't see any issue in that. I think the obsession, the obsession over form to the point where a lot of karate has become form over function is driven by sport. Uh, in particular, uh, kata performance. Now I did kata competitions for years and years and years. I, I did very well at it. Um, but there's this, there's this hyper focus on everything. Um, so finishing your oizuki, so your hips are square versus here. Uh, making sure your, your posture is, is like this instead of like this. Um, all those things do matter in a sport context, but in terms of function, uh, to be able to, to, to punch, uh, to be able to kick, to be able to throw and so on, um, the, the criteria for functionality isn't always the same is the criteria for aesthetics. And I think it's important that we distinguish those two. Now, hold on. I'm not saying that stances are not important, that we shouldn't be practicing them. In my opinion, it should be more uh, of concentration for, for beginning level students. This book is an elaboration of Master Funokoshi's Nijukun, 20 Principles, Guardian Principles of Karate. Uh, the elaborations are written by Nakasone with Funokoshi's approval. Here's what he has to say about Funakoshi's 17th precept, Kamai, or ready stance, is for beginners. Later, one stands in Shizentai, or natural stance. Here's what Nakasone says. While still in the beginning phases, it is important to exert yourself to master the different forms of Kamai. However, concentrating exclusively on Kamai will inhibit the free execution of techniques, and thus the present principle has been introduced. As your training progresses, it is crucial to avoid becoming attached to the concept of Kamai. You must be able to move and change your position freely. He also quotes some unknown sources on the same concept. Do not become distracted by over-concern with whether the physical form of your Kamai is good or bad. That's huge. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. So, in a, a kind of a, a fighting context, uh, not self-defense, so this would be, it, it could be for a karate match, it could be for uh, an MMA match. Um, moving away from fixed stances 
and like I said earlier, moving through those stances or through those positions. So uh, at the beginning level, you might teach someone from this kind of ready position to step off line in a koko tadashi, a back stance, and kick with their front leg, moashigiri like this, okay? And there might be some hand techniques accompanying with that, what right? you're doing like a gidan shuto, uh, moashi, and yakizuki. So very soon, in my opinion, we should be teaching students to break away from this, this kind of stop motion and instead move through that position. So the purpose of your back stance is to have your weight on your back leg. So in a fighting context, I might look something like this. So I'm sparring with my opponent and I want to shift offline. He's advancing towards me. I don't want to be in here anymore. I want to be off his line of fire. So from here, and the footwork might vary depending on the range and distance. Okay, so there may or may not be a little shuffle at the front with the back foot, but here, I'm offline. If I take a picture here, I'm in this position where it looks very similar to a formalized back stance, but I'm not going to stay there. So in slow motion, it looks something like this. I shift off line, weight comes on this foot, and then I kick him as he gets closer. Okay, so that's my interpretation of, uh, of moving through stances and not becoming hyper-focused on the final position is a pretty snapshot. All right, that brings us to number five, a lack of fluidity. That is very much true in traditional kion. If you as a karateka, and that's, if that's all you did, you go into a Muay Thai gym or a boxing gym, maybe you've heard that you're, you're, you're too stiff, you're, you're too tight, you're, you're not fluid, okay? That, that's because of Kata and Kion, the nature of it. And that's the way I look at traditional Kion. So that's a combination that I've done many, many, many times over the past few decades. So from a standing position, we step forward, Gidan Brai, and there's a stop. Even for a split second, it's still a stop. Then right after the Gidan Brai, we make a, a Yakuzuki, and there's a stop. And then there's a hip turn again, and a Kizamazuki, and a stop. Then we step forward, and a Oizuki. Okay, now there's, there's can be some benefit to doing that kind of uh, combination, but I think it's too robotic. It's, it's, it's too stiff. And that stop motion just throws fluidity out the window. So a little faster, it looks something like this. Okay, in my mind, that's not fluid. It's stop, stop, stop between those four techniques. So let's go back to that jab cross, that Kizamazuki Yakazuki combination that is in my curriculum for my white belts testing for their eighth cue. So instead of one, two, one, two, they're up in this free stance. They're not in the long zone kutsudashi. They're up higher, more freely moving, and they're going to shift forward. They're, they're going to use a, a yoriyashi, some footwork, right? So one and two. So it looks like this. One, two, one, two, one, two. We're freely moving. We're not stuck in that stance and we're not doing the stop motion. It's not one and two. Okay, it's, it's all connected and we're fluid. One, two. All right, flaw number six of seven. Uh, Kion is too linear. And this, I think, stems from the, the effects of sport on karate. In point fighting, which is... Uh, that, that is non-contact or maybe a kind of a, a tag, it's hard to score with a hook punch. So if you can't score with a hook punch, you're not going to train a hook punch if your goal is to be a good sport competitor, right? So those circular techniques have kind of fallen by the wayside in karate, and it has been straightened because it's, it's easy to or easier to score with uh, straight punches. There are some exceptions, the haito, okay? But it's a little more easy to control the high tochi than it is the, the hook punch. And for some reason, the judges like it better. So, kagizuki, or hook punch, is in karate. You see it in kata. Uh, you see it in, um, uh, there's a, a, a textbook I bought years and years ago, Master Okazaki, textbook of modern karate. Uh, he has kagizuki in there. Um, but uh, it's, it's never taught. The only punches that I've ever learned in three decades in traditional karate dojos that I trained in were, were straight punches. Um, and I had to kind of teach myself how to do hook punch. But it's there. It's part of karate. So, easy fix. Let's start training for it. So, in my curriculum for my students testing for their 
orange belt and up, that's when we introduce the hook punch. So one of the combinations they do, the yellow belts have to do a jab, cross, and hook, right? One, two, three. The whole time, there's no hikate, it's not one, two, that's just ridiculous. Uh, they have to keep their guard up. So we're incorporating all these principles I've talked about already. Movement, abandoning the long stances, allowing the heel to come up, and it's a different kind of footwork. So when, we, when you do the hook punch, right, your front heel needs to come up, right? Um, and I've seen many, many, many high-ranking black belts. Uh, uh, a fourth band comes in my dojo, and we're doing some pad work. It's boom, boom, hook. And they're doing this. Right? The heel stays on the ground because they've, it's a foreign movement. They've never done it before. So karate, and, and remember, my experience is Shotokan. Uh, if you've done Weichiru, your experience has been completely different. Um, but Shotokan is very, very, very linear, and I think we need to start incorporating some circular techniques. All right, last but not least, number seven. Number seven flaw of traditional kion is lack of context. Uh, this is huge. Remember, my goal for functional kion is to develop skills that can be transferred directly into uh, 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 fighting self-defense. So. When we see this kind of combination, and this is uh, really common in Shotokan. So you step forward with the Shitoke, and there's that stop motion again. You kind of keep this leg bent. You get a Mayashi Mayagiri with your front leg. And as you land, you stay in this back stance and do a Nukite. So that's one of the combinations I had to do for my knee end back in 94. All right. One, two, and three. Uh, if you're really imaginative, you could probably find some kind of application for that, but I can guarantee the, the high-ranking instructors uh, that would teach this sort of thing as, as part of the syllabus of a big organization, uh, there's no thought put into that in terms of how can we effectively apply that. And, and if, if there was an application, it would probably look something like someone attacks you with an oizuki, you step back and block. They conveniently stand there and hold their arm out while we kick for, with their front kick, uh, with their front leg. And then again, they stay there for us while we throw a nuki tail out. Um, it just doesn't make any sense for a com from a combat's perspective, so why do we do it? Uh, and again, uh, the argument that you'll hear over and over and over is, uh, it's just for the development of body movement. Well, again, let's go back to my goal, and again, you might, this might resonate with you, it may not. But my goal is let's make karate functional. Let's make it practical. Let's not just move for the sake of movement because quite frankly, I can go do some parkour and learn some body movement. I can go do a ballet class and learn body movement. I can do Tai Chi and learn body movement. But none of those things are gonna make me a better fighter. And this will not make me a better fighter. It's just not transferable. So when I recently left my large Shotokan organization, to join the World Combat Association, uh, I was struggling with Kion. And as part of the WC, I didn't have to have Kion, but I, I felt I, I needed to do it uh, because I think there's a place for Kion. Uh, it's developed some skills and isolate our skills so we can uh, learn proper technique and then, and then go apply it on the pads or go uh, use it with when we're sparring or whatever the case is. It's, it's skills we're to learn without all the other stimuli to worry about so we can just focus on our footwork and our body mechanics, okay? Um, so I, I wanted to include Kion, but I didn't know how to do it because I, I, I didn't want to do the, uh, the JKA inspired Kion because I just had enough of it and I didn't believe in it. So uh, Ian Abernathy suggested, well, you can just pair it with pad work. I thought that's brilliant. So when I was writing my curriculum, I already had my, my pad drills figured out for all my rank levels from white belt up to black belt test. And all I did was I, I took the pad combinations and made Keon from that. So my white belts in their Keon, they're going one, two, and later on the test, they're gonna hit pads, one, two. They're going to do a Maigiri and an Oizuki. Then they're gonna hit the pads, one, two, groin kick, hit the face. Uh, they're going to do a lot of different things. and. So that's, that was my way, with the Ian's help, of making my Kion functional. It was for the purpose of developing body movement, 
but body movement that was functional. Okay, so let's recap. In my opinion, traditional keto has a lot of flaws and flaws lead to bad habits and bad habits we can call training scars, which are bad habits that will get us in trouble in actual confrontations by pulling our arm back when Hikate or we get knocked out. Uh, by keeping our, our chin up, we get knocked out. By keeping our heel planted on the floor, we can't move. Those are all bad habits that we should try to strive to, to get rid of. Now, I, I would encourage you to use some more, I would call it contextual kion in your, in your training, in your teaching. Now, if you're still in a 3K uh, organization, you're going to have to do your 3K kion to get your students ready for a test. But there's no reason why we can't include this in our, in our regular training. So here's what you need for your blue belt test. Here's how we can make it more functional. So why not adapt, make things more, more transferable? Now, some people might say, they may argue that, well, the traditional kion is good for developing speed and explosiveness. And you know what? I will not deny that. I know for a fact that all the hours I put on the dojo floor with my sensei in, in imploring me to, to go faster, explode, explode, push off the heel, all those things. Yeah, it made my, my, my body motions explosive. Um, but along the way, I, I developed a lot of bad habits and I had to unlearn those habits as a high-ranking black belt in order to become more functional outside of a competitive context. Anyway, uh, I'm sure I gave you lots to think about. Um, you might, uh, a lot of that may have resonated with you. Maybe um, you agree with part of it, maybe a little bit. That's okay. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm Andy Allen for Applied Shotokan. Thanks for watching.